Tonight is a sort of special night, and special meaning that you don't often get the chance to talk about the things that we're going to be talking about tonight. And the, the real sort of clue is that we're going to be talking about them. And that reminds me of the first thing before we get started. I was going to ask you all to take a moment to pull out your cell phones, your smartphones. You don't have to turn them off, because I like when people take pictures and hashtag it with HIV cure and we'll post it somewhere. Just turn down your ringers. All right, so if you don't want to turn off your phone, if you're the type like me who likes to steal pics during an event to get something there, please feel free to do so. And if you want to hashtag it with either an HIV cure or hashtag it with a defeat HIV, even that would be great. Um, so tonight is called Cured, Not Cured. And you're going to be hearing the story of one of the early posmonauts, as I like to call them, someone who is helping us with the cure effort, who knew that he probably did, had a slim chance of being cured himself, but was going to advance us towards a cure, just like those Mercury astronauts who got involved with getting us to the moon, but they themselves never would be the ones to walk on the moon. I'm sort of making that equation when I say posmonaut, and it's, so it's something of an honor. And it's also something important to me. I think anyone who participates in any sort of clinical trial, no matter whether it's for HIV or anything, they're really sort of medical heroes. And a few years back, I had a chance to actually see some of those people speak at a town hall that I helped organize. And it was really sort of emotional to hear those participants who were suffering from some really debilitating conditions talk about why they got involved with the research studies. And so we're here to celebrate all of them by talking about one of them tonight. And so this is your night. It's your chance to ask questions. And we're going to be led through the conversation by three wonderful people who are going to sort of help introduce our guests and then sort of start us off in a conversation. But then we're going to open it up to you. And when that moment comes, we have microphones on the side. And hopefully, we'll have one of our cab members here to help get it to you so you don't have to climb over people people and get out into the aisle here. So we're going to hope for that. Also, you'll just notice when I was talking like this, all of a sudden you couldn't hear me. Um, so you guys can actually help us. This is an informal event. So we have people talking with our handheld mics. If they happen to go like this and you can't hear it, please just give them the sign. Go, hey, can't hear you. And so if an audience goes like that, that's the best chance they'll have instead of me playing a Mama Rose in the back trying to say, sing out sing out, you know, raise up the microphone. So feel free to just kind of tell them, like, I can't hear you, I can't hear you, because they have to hold the mics like this to be caught well for our YouTube channel as well as our Facebook feed. And that's the last part I wanted to remind everyone. We are feeding this live. We're trying it out on our Facebook feed, and we are also putting it on our YouTube channel, recording it. We'll edit it a little bit and then put it up there. But the live Facebook feed is really just smartphone in place and and we're going with it and seeing how that goes. So that'll be on our Facebook page. So if you're interested in sharing this event with anyone afterwards, you can look us up at Defeat HIV Seattle because that's our address on Facebook. You have to have the Seattle part to find us. And you'll be able to see the video. I promise I won't be taking it down. And it's something that you should be able to share with people. So if there was someone here tonight or someone who was going to try to get here tonight and they didn't get here, um, and you know that, you can kind of send it to them, splash it on their wall, let them have it. And lastly, you'll see that there's some great slides up above us, and that's to give you a little bit of the information about the story tonight, um, just to get you sort of your appetites whetted so you know what to ask or what you might be curious about. So there's lots to go into with what has happened tonight. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our three fabulous co-hosts. So we have over here in the corner, Trinisha. Matt and Manuel, and they are all highly distinguished people working in various forums in the HIV community. So without further ado, I'm going to let you guys take over the night, okay? Okay, so my name is Trinisha. Um, I am the person who's going to start the night, kind of give us like a purpose why we're all here together. Um, so before I start, if you can just indulge me, um, if folks are willing can you say to the person next to you or behind or front in you, um, I am glad that you're here today. I'm glad that you're here today. <laughs> 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 
Thank you. It's just a little warm up just to get people a little more comfortable with strangers. And it's really important that we're all here in this room together. So I just kind of wanted to um, point that out. Um, so we are here together um, this evening to talk about um, HIV remission um, and what that means for people who are living with this chronic um, condition, HIV. Um, some folks might be here to learn what the science is all about um, behind these HIV care studies, and others might be here to learn about how this impacts their friends, their families, their communities, loved ones, or even themselves. Um, so there's no better way to dive into some of these questions that we might have, or comments, or thoughts, or even some concerns, um, to uh, share space uh, with all of us, um, with a person that lived it themselves. Um, and also the researcher um, who will be here as well. So this is a really great opportunity to start these conversations. Um, also, just to remind you all, this is a space that we're all participating in. So yes, we're gonna be doing some talking up here just for like, you know, a few minutes just to start the conversation, kind of get, you know, your brains activated and kind of gear up some questions and stuff like that. But um, there will be a community portion around 7.45-ish um, where you all can, like Michael said, to ask some of those really valuable and important questions. Um, yeah. So um, now I'm going to hand over to my co-host, um, Matt. Are you, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, so welcome. Um, it's great to see you all here. Thanks for showing up. And uh, I think you're going to learn a lot tonight. Um, and just remember to take one thing home tonight, at least. Just re think of, remember something valuable that you learned tonight, if anything at all. And that can be whatever you want it to be. Um, but just make sure you leave something uh, from what you learned um, when you leave tonight. Um, so I'm... I'm uh, uh, you, you can read all about me in the program, um, or not. But so I'm not going to talk a lot about me. But I want to introduce um, one of the scientists here tonight, uh, who was um, really formidable in in this whole uh, area of cure research. And actually, it's kind of interesting. Where is where is uh, Timothy? By the way. Oh, oh, oh! He's going to appear. He's going to make an appearance. Um, uh, I first heard Timothy at, I, I think it was a Croy where he, where he first, you know, spoke about this, um, at a major conference, this, this trial that we're going to, um, talk about tonight. And I, I, I wish he was in here because I wanted to hear this. But anyway, um, it's to, for you all as well. He was one of the most interesting and engaging researchers and scientists to, to present, a study at a at a medical conference for doctors and researchers that I've ever heard. I mean, he was he was so kind of captivating and just like real up there on the stage, in terms of how he presented presented the, the data and the information. So, so uh, and you'll get that tonight when you when when he speaks. I think. So, um, Timothy Heinrich, are you around? Are you here with us? Uh, yay! <laughs> Door number one. <laughs> Either, either, either place. So uh, Timothy was uh, at, in Boston, and uh, now he's at UCSF. And you actually you live in Berkeley now too, right? I live about three blocks away from you, I believe. Yeah. So, and, and we haven't had coffee yet. So, um, but yeah, we, we discovered that not too long ago when he moved. But yeah. so, welcome, Timothy. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so my name is uh, Manuel Venegas, and uh, one of the things that I'll be doing is uh, introducing Gary. But uh, another thing that I want to point out is that um, the four um, of us who are HIV positive, we represent the different uh, realms of HIV positivity. So for me, I'm, I would be one of those recently infected individuals, but um, so all of us represent different realms, and it's something that, um, for me, I would want to take out from all of this is that um, the community really isn't so homogeneous uh, or isn't so the sameness as it is in real life. So I want to kind of appreciate everyone here for that <laughs> kind of lovely experience. 
Um, so Gary is, um, he was a long-term non-progressor, 20-year-long uh, um, long-term non-progressor. And so that's um, kind of a unique area of study in this um, field of HIV cure research. So um, Gary Skokol. on yeah. um, about asking questions if you ask a question you get a cookie Great. awesome um, so uh, so what's uh, I'm gonna start off the conversation with an obvious question to both um, Tim and Gary um, to move our conversation forward um, so how did you two um, find each other um, and also, how did this all come about? Um, in 2012, I had um, progressed through a stem cell transplant, the second of my life, after previously having had two rounds of chemotherapy. So I'd been on a medical roller coaster. Uh, my oncologist at uh, Dana Faber, Brigham and Women's in Boston, during one of our follow-ups said, by the way, there's a researcher who wants to meet you because you fit the protocol for an HIV cure research study that he's doing. And I was like, great. Um, so it might have actually been that same day. Um, it was. It was, yeah. Knowing Tim, he was probably waiting outside the door. I was. You was. <laughs> I was listening, too. Well, it was the money that I was... Oh, no. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I think we only paid you $25. Yeah. So um, he came in, and the first thing, the two things I first noticed about Tim as we started to talk was um, his bubbly personality and sort of an infectious style of life. Um, and those are two great uh, connectors for me. So that's our first introduction. Um, how do you remember it? Yeah, you know, so uh, Gary, you were our very first patient in our study, uh, and I was very nervous. Because I had talked to, to Rob Soifer, I said, oh, you know, he would be perfect for the study. We would love to, you know. And he said, well, let me talk with him and see if he's interested. So I said, okay. So I was outside that door <laughs> as he was doing it, <laughs> kind of shaking, you know, a little bit nervous, seeing what was happening. Uh, and when I walked in, it was just all of a sudden I thought, wow, this, I think this is going to go well. I think, you know, I think he's going to be excited to be part of our study. Uh, and that really makes me happy. So... I think about five minutes in. I didn't tell you we were, did I tell you you were the first patient enrolled or not? Did I? Um, I don't remember that part, though I do remember the part when we got to, you know, you saying, Gary, you can choose, you know, do you want to be patient? It really was patient A or patient B. Um, though I was the first and I knew that, I actually chose to be patient B. Don't ask me why, it's one of those. It sounds better, you know, it's, it's like, <laughs> Everyone's patient A, but patient B is interesting. So. <laughs> We've been messing with you a lot. So patient B was the first patient enrolled. Patient A was the second patient enrolled. Uh, and uh, Gary doesn't live in Boston. <laughs> so, can I, can I ask a question uh, in lines to this? So how many of you have been in a research trial? Just raise your hands. So many of you are familiar with the process of, of getting into a study. Can, can you guys just talk a little bit about how your, this process might have been different than a regular or you, a, another process for another study? I mean, there are going to be a variety of ways that patients get enrolled in, in trials, right? But, but how is this different than what would be like a... Well, a, a the, the premise of the study was, um, in the simple terms, would a stem cell transplantation cure HIV? Um, and that is a corollary to what Tim Ray Brown went through, but he went through it receiving cells that were specifically resistant to the HIV virus. Um, I did not. That was not part of the protocol when I went through my um, study. So when this was presented to me to participate in the study, and Tim and I talked, and I very quickly understood um, I was one of the very, very few possible candidates. It wasn't um, 
you know, like much of the others or many of the others where there's a large population to draw from, um, so much so that in the early stages of the study, when Tim and I would talk, and I knew there were a very few number in the participants, you know, in the study, and Tim could never tell me um, how I was doing versus how the rest of them were doing, so he would tell me, you know, how, the, how all of them were doing, and they might give me some little bit about me, but I also knew there were only two of us in the study. <laughs> so it's like, I could figure it out, but, he, you know, his There's ethics were absolutely, he could not tell me what my <coughs> protocol was. You know, you're all doing this, and you're doing this specifically. You know, it's like, okay, we, so. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I think we, we confronted you with a 32-page consent form, I mean, it was, it was big. Uh, we've been working on that, by the way, to make that a little bit more streamlined yeah. for participants yeah. and potential participants. But uh, th this was something that, you know, it just it wasn't very common, and it's not, it was a very rare population, as you were saying. So, uh, and it's a population that had other comorbidities. They've had cancer, they've had malignancies of various sorts, and they've needed uh, therapies for refractory disease. Um, so we were, you know, we went in worried about, you know, kind of personally worried about the participants and we're always thinking, I think, about safety when we first started this and I think we even held back uh, on some of the interventions or some of the sampling that we could have done uh, because we really didn't know what to expect and this was really new for us, so. And that was a big part of why I chose to participate was in the dialogue that went on for weeks and months, I felt absolutely trusting of Tim and the team and that they were giving me a straightforward, direct conversation. Um, having come from before this, cancer treatment, it could kill me. Cancer treatment, it could kill me. Stem cell transplant, it could kill me. Stem cell transplant, it could kill me. Oh, by the way, join this research study, it could kill you. <laughs> it's like, okay, I, I trusted them, you know, um, and that was, that was huge, that was huge. Where did that, so, well, where did that trust where did the trust come from? Um, one is it comes from my desire to trust, um, to believe that we're acting in collaboration um, rather than I'm a number on a file. Uh, that was crucial. I felt very personalized. Um, and the dialogue that went back and forth. You know, it, it's just, it's Tim's nature to be straightforward um, with, with a wry sense of humor. Yeah, uh, I would like to talk about, um, so what uh, was the most challenging part as you participating in the trial, and what was the most challenging part you kind of um, as a researcher in this specific clinical trial? Um, there are so many. Um, you know, from the times I would be visiting my doctors for follow-up on the stem cell transplant and seeing Tim, and I would go in, uh, if you've all done this, you go usually for this, it's the first thing you do is have blood done. And I would look at the number of tubes. <laughs> and it's like, really, is there anything left? Um, and I don't like that. I mean, for all the times I've been stuck, it's just, I didn't like it. Um, Yeah, I, uh, I think the hardest part of the study came later when we decided to, to come off antiretroviral therapy. Mm. That, that uh, I, we, I, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but um, one, one of the challenges that we had putting this together was how could we come up with a plan that was safe or that we felt was as safe as possible, but also maximize obviously what we were going to learn from the study. And if we were gonna put someone at risk, we wanted to make sure uh, that we had a, a plan in action, we had uh, contingency plans, we had everything that was gonna be in place. And in fact, our, uh, I worked with the Dana Farber, I, I think it took us about seven months to get the study approved uh, with our uh, IRB. And part of that was because we wanted to have include the oncologists in the dialogue, we wanted to include the participants in the dialogue, which is actually not usually done uh, in this setting. But because it was a small number of people, uh, we wanted to do that. We had outside experts in to advise us as well. Uh, but, but we really wanted to make sure that there was a safe way of doing this, as well as uh, an opportunity to learn something scientifically very interesting. Uh, and I think this was the first time I ever did a reservoir study. So mm -hmm. I had I've done other, I'd worked with patients before in these studies, but to collect you know, up to 160 to 180 cc's of blood uh, later on when we ate for East and, and did gut biopsies and whatnot. So it was really just the intensive nature of what we were doing was also new uh, for us as well. And um, 
So it, it, was, it was a challenge, I think, overall. And in that, it was a dialogue back and forth. Tim and I would talk about, we'd like to do this, we'd like to do this. Are you willing to do this? Um, so much so that, we, and our humors connect. You know, at one point I said, it sounds like you want to put me through a meat grinder and just look at every cell in my body, and it's, but that's not really good for my health. Um, and in humor, yes, that was true, but we came to, actually there was one point where uh, there was a desire to get brain cells and we talked about it and it's like, no, you know, th there's a line here. Um, we didn't push that one too hard, but. No, no. I think it was a negotiation. If you don't do this, you'll do the other. Maybe he'll do the LP if we don't. But I was, again, very respectful and willing to do because I felt the outcomes were so important, uh, whether for me personally or for our entire world. Um, so I, I pretty much was like, yeah, just you know, take my body, go for it. How would you check um, for um, brain cells? Like, what's that process like? <laughs> so, so that, that, yeah, we weren't, we weren't actually going to uh, biopsy Gary's brain. We did, we, did, uh, we did do a lumbar puncture uh, at, at some point through the time. So, uh, and I think the, there was only about six or seven cells there. So uh, there, weren't, there weren't that many. But uh, no, yeah, that's a good... There are, there are limits that we will not go, uh, obviously, for patient safety, even though it would be scientifically fascinating. Yeah, and remember, some of my memory of this is shaded by such an emotional quotient. It's hard, um, it's hard to remember exactly the details. Um, in the context of saying, you know, they wanted my brain cells, I, I use that metaphorically because it was, you know, the slicing and dicing, and I understood it. I understood it to make sure that they have an absolute knowledge that I fit the protocol and that we cannot find the virus. Um, you know, I, I came to understand that whereas most people would have normal tests, you know, go in for normal tests, the decimal point was moved so much further across for me because they had to be sure, and tell, correct me if I'm wrong, that it really isn't found, you know, at an assay level so much more detailed. Absolutely. Um, speaking just a little bit about medications because it's brought up, um, as like someone who is undetectable and on medications for like 26 years my entire life, um, and then because of this trial, you have to get off the medications. What was that like for you mentally? And then also just like, did you notice any changes being off medications for that period of time? Um, how did you get into this mindset of like, okay, I'm gonna take off, take, you know, stop taking medications. There possibly of maybe being resistance to other medications if it didn't work. Um, after all of the foundations were laid, it was the discussion of, okay, it's time make the date. And we talked and it was, we, you know, I chose it and Tim was, it's like, it was March 12th, 2013. Um, and I remember that date vividly. Um, it was the, because for me, medications were in the morn. So I would wake up, go into the kitchen, open the drawer, pull out, you know, the vial that has all the preset meds. And I open the drawer and there they are and it's, I'm not taking them. And if this works as we're hoping it does, I will never take them again. Um, I have a photographic memory. I can see myself standing in my kitchen at that moment still. It's just one of those, it's the JFK assassination moment. It was monumental and, and indescribable. Um, I knew there would be likely ramifications. That was part of what we discussed and I was aware of. Um, that was my choice. Thank you. It's fascinating to me that, that you went through that process. I don't think, you know, we have talked a lot about that as av advocates as actually, you know, a tryout or, you know, like a, a mental way to process that before you did it. But so everybody understand, I, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll get into questions but I hope everyone understands the ramifications of these cure trials that are being run today. Some of them, that that when when they start looking at in, into patients, and it's going to be a real challenge for those in the community who may not want to interrupt their drug treatment, um, or there may be an issue or a reason why they shouldn't do that. I, I want to just say for a minute, I was in a, a, a early cure trial for. Uh, a gene therapy product um, um, 
couple, uh, God, it's been like seven years ago now. I can't believe it, six years ago. Um, but it was looking into um, a product to ba basically render my own T cells resistant to HIV, basically, simply put. And um, so we went through the study and everything went fine. I'm fine, I'm still here, I'm not cured, but uh, I'm here. Um, but um, we learned something from that trial and there's something very interesting that came out of that trial that was a, sort of a side conversation actually that um, is a little more detail that I wanna get into tonight. But, but what, I'm, what I'm getting at is that, um, you know, there's, there's these studies that are gonna be happening where there's, there's gonna be moments where the, the participants in the trial, maybe up front will be asked in the informed consent whether they wanna interrupt their drug treatment or not. And then there's some studies that along the way, they'll say, well, maybe this was just because this was an early trial that I was in, but they came to me and they said, do you want, can't, will you interrupt drug treat, your drug treatment? Because I was in, my study was designed for us to, to all stay on our treatments while we had this, this, trans, this um, uh, um, product infused into our bodies. And, and I said, no, I, I couldn't do it. And, but I'm a very different, I guess maybe different in that, I mean, I guess what we're getting at here is there, the, these trials are gonna be very different in nature. And so it's gonna be really challenging to explain, you know, what's involved, why um, you, you might be asked to, to interrupt your drug treatment or not. So it's, it's, it's gonna be a very complex thing and it's gonna be weighed on a lot of different reasons for why somebody would want to enter a trial, basically, so. Um, just consider that, I guess, if you're, if you're thinking about a study um, going into. So, um, it, it's something we don't take lightly when we offer it as well. So this is, this is something that, uh, if done correctly, is very well thought out. Uh, there's a huge amount of planning that goes into a treatment interruption yeah. study and follow-up and, and, and what to do if what happens or doesn't happen. Um, so, and I think right now there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a discussion ongoing about how, how should we do these. Now, there's, a, there's a few treatment interruption studies coming up now that don't even involve an intervention. They're just asking folks to come off of enterovirus therapy and just see what happens. Uh, to look for either biomarkers or for other other requests. So, so there there may be different uh, motives or whatnot for this, but they're usually you know quite well thought out and and ahead of time. And there's been a lot of discussion, I think, about uh, when is it safe to do this and when is it appropriate to do this as well. And I think that has to be a discussion between the physician researchers and yourself uh, as potential participants too. And in the study I was participating in, and correct me if I'm wrong, the um, another participant came off medications um, after me, but his virus returned soon. Um, I think it was at the 15-week right. mark. Patient A, yes. Patient A, mm -hmm. right. Yep, <laughs> participant A. In the vast array of people in the study, patient A and patient B. Um, and at that moment, um, that was another of those trusting moments where the call from Tim, it's like, this is what's happened. Do you want to go back on meds? Do you want to step out of the protocol um, and go back on meds? And we went through further discussions. One of them, which I remember, was my donor match was a better match than the other patient's match. Um, and that could be pragmatically true or emotionally true for me, but that holding on to that was like, okay, this is so important to advancing science, you know, Let's keep going. So you know, it's interesting. Normally in a, in a clinical trial, we would not inform a participant about how another participant does before the study is over. It's, it's highly atypical to do this. And when patient A rebounded, we, I, did not I did not feel comfortable not approaching Gary partly because it was a small study. This is not your typical trial to begin with. And if word gets out, news gets out, you're gonna learn from it and not from us. And, and that, and you know, this, this, I, we felt that you had the right to know. 
So I actually approached our uh, IRB, our Institutional Review Board, about this, our Ethics Committee, and I said, I'm in a bit of a bind. Uh, I would really like to change this protocol to offer him, to give him the updated information, obviously anonymously, right? So no one knows who, who else is participating, but the details enough to really kind of guide a, a decision-making process. And uh, I'll tell you, it was, almost, it was new for them as well, uh, for the Ethics Committee. And it, 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 there was a couple of days of intense discussion. Uh, I mean, only a couple of days, because that's all we had before we wanted to tell you. So uh, to, to really to what we did, and then we kind of came up with this plan and, and felt that it was the right way to go. Uh, but I think, you know, I, I remember the first day of medical school, I learned, what is your job? The first, your first and only job is to take care of your patient. You are your patient's advocate. And I, I see that also with trials. You, you, you have to be an advocate for the participants in these trials that go like this. So, uh, and that's what I presented, and, and I think everybody agreed. And then we uh, wanted to keep Gary in that discussion and be part of that decision-making process. Again, highly unusual for a trial. So can I take a step back here and just ask Timothy, if you would just give us a little bit of a summary of what, the, what happened in the trial and uh, what the trial was how it was designed, and what, what were the results. Because I don't think everybody, and we talked about that, just to, just to give a little summary. Gary probably knows better than I do, having undergone it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it, we, we have a, it's, it's, and it's still ongoing in, in various forms, but uh, to enroll individuals that have HIV, that are taking antiretroviral therapy, that are undergoing stem cell, stem cell transplantation for any indication. This could be autologous stem cell transplant where you get your own cells back. Could be allogeneic stem cell transplant, like Gary, where you get another donor uh, from an HIV negative donor that's transplanted. Uh, and we follow them over a certain period of time. And we do intensive reservoir analysis. We do large volume blood collections, all the 16 tubes we had waiting for you every visit, and uh, you know everything from Oh, I'm sorry, the reservoir is the, the number of infected cells that remain on antiretroviral therapy. So even with excellent suppressive ART, there are always cells that harbor HIV, except apparently in, in certain transplant situations. But there are always cells that persist. And when someone stops ART, within a few weeks, almost guaranteed, those cells will start to make virus and start to infect other cells, and you have replication and whatnot. So, uh, what we wanted to do is to see what did stem cell transplant do to the numbers of those cells that were HIV infected, not just in the blood, but also in tissue as well. So in gut tissue, which has a large number of CD4 T cells that harbor HIV and is a main site, and a, and a large reservoir, this residual infected cell burden after ART is started. So, uh, and obviously lymph nodes going forward now too. I think you skipped out on, we, we got our protocol together after, after you, so uh, you, you escaped one procedure to update that we offered you at that point, but <laughs> we're doing that now, so you can, you can come back anytime. Um, <laughs> uh, so we would, we would look, and we had a threshold. Um, we had a threshold of if we lost detection in terms of cells, if we stimulate them, if they're able to make infectious virus, is what we call an outgrowth assay. But we have, the, we take millions and billions of cells actually from, from a participant and we try to stimulate them in a Petri dish. We just slam them with, you know, things that make them very upset. And when cells are upset, they start making virus. So we, we activated these cells, we, we insulted them in the Petri dish, not in the, not in the body, fortunately. Uh, and we wanna see if any virus would come out. And if there was no virus that came out that was able to infect other cells, that's when we would then go to step B, which was an optional treatment interruption. So it's a two-phase study where there's this observational period, tissue collection, and then if everything has been set and we can't find that reservoir, then we would go on to take people off of therapy. And then we wait, and we sample often. We started twice a week or every week? No, once a week. Once a week once started, a week. yeah. Uh, and we were also doing intermittent, uh, not just for the virus in the bloodstream, but for cells that were circulating in the blood that may also have HIV. And we did that very, very often, uh, and more often in the first uh, several months of the study as well. And if virus comes back, uh, we would uh, start to start ART as soon as possible uh, to minimize any potential harm uh, to the participant and start collecting a lot more again, so. Yeah, just, and, and a follow-up question after that. Um, so, uh, analytic treatment interruption, um, one, how uh, essential is that for remission? 
Um, can we have that while we're taking our antiretrovirals? Um, and what kind of impact would it be for efficacy of achieving remission if we've had to change our medication pretty like frequently? Yeah, great questions. Um, so in terms of transplant or in terms of general? In, remission. In general remission. So uh, and remission in terms of response to ART or uh, trying to under... Like an HIV cure. Oh, okay. So if there's there, if there's an intervention that potentially cures, so so yeah. So one one thing is that um, what the Dana Farber uh, was doing in consultation with our division, and this is what set up this, is that we were giving ART during transplantation and during chemotherapy. There are other centers, I think, the, including the NCI, that were actually taking people off of ART during a transplantation or during chemotherapy or some other type of intervention. But our thought was that if you leave people on antiretroviral therapy, then those cells, as the donor cells are coming in, will be protected from becoming infected. And it was critical that we would keep people on their antiretroviral therapy during that time and after that time was going to be extremely important. So I think a lot of the, a lot of the trials and how they're designed is that there, there usually is a point where that initial intervention is done while ART is still being given and, is, and, and, and people are still suppressed. But some of the trials now, after that intervention has been performed, whatever it may be, whether it's a modification stem cell uh, or if it's uh, uh, you know, another immunotherapy, then treatment is interrupted to see what the effect of that intervention would be. And some don't have that. Some keep people on antiretroviral therapy and able to kind of look. Now, the problem with stem cell, not the problem, but the, the, the good thing about stem cell transplant is that we couldn't find any HIV in Gary. I mean, we looked hard, and we, I mean, we just, I mean, yeah. I mean, we you we definitely looked hard, <laughs> and and we couldn't find it. Uh, I was surprised we didn't have lab contamination, for example. That maybe we thought we had it, but we didn't. And fortunately, that was not a problem. It has been a problem subsequently, but 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 it was not a problem. But because we couldn't find it, we were in a bind. What do we do? I mean, we could just leave you on ART for the next ten years and continue not to find it. But that, how, what are we going to learn from that? So this is where we felt that to really, in order to really figure out what was going on, we needed to stop therapy. That was the only way that we could really know, is it going to come back if we stop? I mean, we just couldn't find anything. So it wasn't about, you know, we, th we thought we had a 1,000 to 10,000 fold decrease in the amount of HIV in your body. But since we couldn't find it, we just had, we had no idea. So uh, that's the reason that we, we did the trim. But we actually, we actually kept... Our, and keep, still keep our participants on therapy for a few years after a transplant because we think it's necessary for that period of time in order to really allow the, the donor cells to kind of clear out. So, And as, um, as I understood it, when the virus returned in the dialogue we had, um, I believe you explained it to me that because of the genetics, you, f you suspect there were two or four cells that had survived the transplant. And with the humor we had, I'm like, they were sitting right there, right there at the end of the finger. They were just hiding out. But the idea that two to four cells survived, um, you know, I'm a math guy. Make it zero, you know, it, it would have been so much better, so much different. So, so this was one of the most disappointing scientifically from the standpoint was that we were, well, actually Rob Soifer was able to get your, your, your HIV reservoir to a point so low that not only could we not find it, but when it, when it did come back, it essentially looked like it came from one or two cells. And when we, we've mathematically modeled this as well and have found that the number of infected cells in your body before you came off therapy may have been the order of 20 or so, 20 to 40. But that's all it took. Um, it bought you some time, which was great. Um, but that's all it took. And I think that was depressing scientifically when we first saw that. Uh, obviously, you know, there's a lot of other issues, but, um, but it was also highly informative. I think it really, it really kind of not only set the challenge for what we needed to do, but it also led to a lot of very, very interesting research on looking for reservoirs, trying to find them, find markers that may not be directly viral to do that. So yeah, it's led to a lot of, a lot of different, a, a lot of great studies actually. Yeah, it, uh, I think it absolutely sort of changed the thinking really about how problematic this, this is going to be to actually end up curing and getting rid of every 
HIV cell in the body or every HIV particle. So, I mean, that I, from my perspective anyway, it's, it, it, it hit the new, I mean, this, this trial hit the new, it hit major media, it was in, in the newspapers and everywhere. And, and in the scientific community, it was really, uh, real, I think a turning point really for, for a lot of thinking around this. Um, and to follow that, when the virus returned, I was emotionally deflated. I was, you know, I went to the dark space. I was just so sad. Um, but I was also deeply, deeply sad for the team, for Tim and the team, because we had, we had this bond. Um, and I was feeling like I hadn't let you and the team down. And I remember over the weeks and months that followed, you actually had to talk me up from that space and leave me with what you have given to the scientific community is incalculable. You have changed and advanced directions that were never going to be found, or well, I should say weren't found up until that moment. And that helped me to start turning the sadness into really pride, um, and, and, and I still have it, that I have helped you. Um, and by helping you, I'm helping us. You didn't let us down. Okay. <laughs> We thought we let you down. We had the same. No, no. I, you, yeah, okay, we're going to go back and forth. Okay, on we're going to go back and forth. <laughs> no, we let you down. Uh, I have to say the the most. Uh, I don't think I've ever said this, but the most difficult thing I've ever had to do as part of my professional life is to tell you and participant A that their virus was back. That was that was the most difficult thing I've ever had to do in my in my professional career. Okay, so um, we've been talking a lot. Uh, I'm sure you have questions. If you'd like to a ask a question, if you would come to either of these microphones, and we'll take come to the microphones and, and ask it. Or, oh, oh, sorry, okay. Okay, last time we lined up, but this time we could, great, okay. How long did your um, process take? Um, I stopped medication on March 12th, 2013. Uh, middle October, I started to feel the flu. Uh, a couple of days, about three, four days later, went into the hospital in the middle of a Tuesday night, had the test done. By Thursday morning, I knew the results. By Friday, I, uh, Friday or Saturday, I was back on medication, which became another discussion point where um, under the construct of I was zero converting for the first time, that might be thought of what my body was going through, though it really was the second time, that I started medications so quickly, literally within days, um, is another part. But the process was almost to the date 32 weeks. Short. Uh, long. <laughs> <laughs> Not long enough. Mm -hmm. um, but are you HIV negative now? No, no, I'm I'm positive. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. When the virus came back, it was in the millions. I mean, that as in normal serial conversion, it's just you know through the roof. Well, my my question would be: Are are you control? Your virus is controlled now. You're on yes. therapy. Yeah. Okay. So it's you, undetectable. So so this is the this is the good at least the good point of these kind of studies is that usually the virus can can be controlled once again if it's if there's a breakthrough in, in certain conditions. In my right. case, absolutely. I don't know of anyone else, um, but I I'm not scientifically knowledgeable enough to say as a blanket that. That will happen with anyone. No, it's not. It's not all a sure thing. But, yeah. But there are certain conditions, right? Like so, in my trial, they asked me to to go off my medications. But I'm I'm a immunologic non-responder, which means that I've been uh, living with HIV for a long time, and um, I started taking medicines from day one. So I became. I, I have a, a lot of resistant uh, virus um, that's archived in my body. In other words. It's waiting out in filing cabinets in my body. So, um, um, so, so if, if for, for whatever reason I stopped medications, the chances are that I could start something new and there's options for me are pretty slim. So, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's situations where it wouldn't be prudent, shall we say. Well, in a comparison, um, one thing we learned through this study 
was um, I had inherited one genetic defect from one of my parents. So I was, that's what, for 20 years, I was a non-progressor. I was not on medications. Now we have a much greater understanding of why. When I received my sister cells, unfortunately, they both work. <laughs> so coming off medication was in another construct more risky um, because now the, the lock was fully openable. Um, but it was absolutely worth it to me. Absolutely still is. Hi. Uh, I have to believe that at some point everybody who's HIV positive thinks for a moment what would it feel what what would it feel like to be negative? Like what was that like before and what would it feel like now? And if it's possible for you to separate the exhilaration of being the second person to be cured or, or however few if you can separate that and just isolate the sensation of, well, today I'm, I'm negative today. What, um, I, I don't know, I mean, I'm um, undetectable and, and I don't feel anything, right? So I, I don't know that I would expect to feel differently, but, but mentally, I, from a sense of identity, like what is yeah. that like? And that'll come and back to, lose to that. as well your question. When I stopped taking medication, there was no physical change. Um, it was purely emotional. As the months went on, and there was a period in there where I started to believe myself um, HIV negative, um, and there was no medical um, proof otherwise. Tim and I had long talks about this. I wasn't going out and telling the world. You know, a very small circle of friends and my family knew. Um, but in using a word you used, that was exactly my experience. I felt isolated. It was an experience that other than Tim Ray Brown, no one in the world knew. Um, I live in New York, and I remember for days and weeks as I was going wherever I was going, walking around, seeing thousands of people and feeling I'm different than every one of them. You know, we have been through, many of us, born HIV negative, become HIV positive, I then had a period of time in my mind where I felt I was HIV negative and it was absolutely hope speaking. You know, why not? <laughs> why not hold on to hope? Um, and then the crash, when it's, it's gone, you know, that, that hope is gone. Um, it, it's, um, it's, it's indescribable. Um, um, it, it's elating uh, and scary at the same time. Um, okay. Thanks, um, for, thanks for asking. So I think the gentleman in the white. Yeah, I just wanted to know when you um, sewer converted for the second time, did you have to change your drug regimen? Um, no, I went back on the same medications I had been on before. They have been changed. There are new medications that are better for me, um, but no didn't have any drug resistance? Um, I had had some drug resistance previously. It wasn't new. That, that's correct, Tim, yeah? Yeah, but not, not to what you were taking. So, right, yeah. right, yes. Yeah. Not, to, not to the classes of medication. Yeah. So your, your medication was fully active? Yes. Okay, down uh, the ladies in front here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, Timothy. Um, I've been confused from the beginning as far as when you consider this a clinical trial when there were only two people involved. Does not a clinical trial usually involve hundreds and hundreds of people? And what did you expect to learn from just two people? I, I Yeah. No, that, that's a great question. So uh, technically, this was not what the NIH would define as a clinical trial for these reasons. Um, there was no trial, inter we were not trialing a new intervention or a new drug or a new therapy. In fact, we were scaling back on an existing therapy, which if obviously is you could, that's a, that's a clinical trial. But the problem, but also the great thing about stem cell transplantation is that it's very rare to need to have a stem cell transplantation. Stem cell transplantation is not something that right now, in the current form that you had uh, for malignancies and the other uh, complications from the prior chemo and, and autologous stem cell transplant, 
was something that we could do to someone who is otherwise healthy now and just on suppressive ART. It's too risky. There's over a 20% mortality involved simply from the transplant itself. Uh, and there has been some evidence that uh, people living with HIV may do slightly worse uh, when they do get a transplant from, from certain studies. So it's, it's not something that we can enroll 30, 40, 300, or 400 people and just give them a stem cell transplant. So we were, we, were, we were in a position where we were looking for patients that needed a stem cell transplant for, for another reason and really did need that stem cell transplant. So it was more of a pros what we would call a prospective cohort where we assemble potential participants based on the intervention is, is being given for a different indication, but we were going to learn from it on the same time. And so for us, it was a sample of convenience. But the problem is, is that there's just not a lot of people living with HIV that were undergoing allogeneic stem cell transplants. There's, you know, it's a handful. So uh, would we have liked to have studied more individuals? Absolutely. But I think going back to the second part of your question, is there something that we can learn from only one or two people? Was it worth doing the trial for just, you know, two or three people? And I would have to say absolutely. And the reason is that if we look at Timothy Ray Brown, I was a clinical fellow. Um, I was training in infectious diseases in 2007. And I was, you know, was thinking, what, what do we need to do? I was learning about drug resistance. And all of a sudden, I read the New England Journal article with one person. It was Timothy Ray Brown. He wasn't Timothy then. It was the Berlin patient. And it wasn't a cure. It was long-term remission with Delta 32, Delta 30, blah, 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 blah. You know, that was actually a very long title. Um, hard to interpret. So I was shocked. I mean, this, this, this completely changed the way that we approached HIV disease. There was a proof of concept that you could cure HIV. I mean, I, you know, I, I, mean, I grew up in the late 80s and 90s. Curing HIV, oh my gosh, you know, this is, I mean, this is huge. And I think that the scientists and, and everybody just got so excited that this was possible. Yeah, it wasn't going to be for everybody or maybe for even a lot of people, but that we were going to learn from this. And that's actually what got me interested in doing this study with Gary, was this one, this one patient. And then it becomes two patients, and then it becomes 10. And as you keep doing this, you keep learning. I think there was a great article in one of the science journals recently about in HIV cure that even trials with small numbers of patients can be incredibly, incredibly useful in terms of the knowledge that we've gained and how we can go on and learn from that and develop the next trial that comes next. So, but those are great questions, yeah. And it's very atypical from how we normally think of, 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 of clinical science, for sure. So Gary had had some sort of like cancer or something, then he was being treated with chemo, and, and that was one of the requirements for your study? For the program? Um, I had lymphoma in 2003. Oh. It returned three years later. Um, the chemo for that was not successful, so I moved on to an autologous stem cell transplant, which was my own cells being reintroduced. You know, stem cell transplantation is, a, is simplistically just high-dose chemo. Um, then a few years later, um, after that stem cell transplant, I ended up with MDS, myodysplastic syndrome, which is um, my bone marrow is not functioning correctly. It's not producing either appropriate numbers or the right types of white, red, or platelets. Um, then I moved on to a second stem cell transplant, which now couldn't be my own because that's where the problem was. And fortunately, I have one sibling, and it's a one and a quarter, you know, it's a 25% match likelihood. She was a match. So I had the best match you can other than a twin. Um, so I, oh yeah, I, I've been on the roller coaster. <laughs> so you sound like a very lucky guy. But it looks like you're doing really, really well. I hope so. Thank you. But anyway, um, Gary, thank you for um, sharing your story with all of us, and for um, for being courageous um, and. Helping, helping us learn how to bring her into HIV. I appreciate you from my heart. Um, a lot of my questions have already been answered, but I did want to ask the researcher something about, you talked about biomarkers and for potential participants. Um, what does that look like for women? Um, it, does cancer have to be already present for this to work or 
Um, that's my question for you. And then my la last question for Gary would probably be about your quality of life as you were going through this, um, through the treatment. Thank you. Yeah, to answer the first part, um, again, great question. So one of the things that we're trying to do is when, when it's difficult to find HIV by the routine methods, we're obviously always trying to increase the way and the ability for us to find infected cells or evidence of infection, whether it's looking for directly for virus within cells, DNA, genetic material, or if it's looking for something else that may not have anything to do with HIV but goes along with HIV. But I think you also brought up an interesting question about women, too, in that, you know, are there gender differences in, in how people respond to HIV or how we think about curative strategies? And there probably are, yeah. So, and, I, you know, a lot of studies have traditionally been mostly men uh, in the studies. And I think that, you know, there's a, there's a large push now and I think a large need uh, to have a lot of uh, diversity within the potential participants within the trials, because it is it is possible that that people may respond differently or have uh, different different levels of HIV or different immune control uh, or just different response in general, um, and that's something we know very little about uh, in HIV. What that gender and other diversity within the participants are, and I think it's something that we absolutely have to explore. When you say gender and other diversity, you mean yeah. diversity? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. From a quality of life perspective, um, there are so many directions to, to, for me to address it as. Um, one, I think, was in those months that I felt I was HIV negative, um, there was a, a reignited sense within myself, you absolutely have to take care of yourself uh, even more than ever before. Um, and I think, for me, it was one of those moments where the long-term effects of HIV are still to be found out for people who are 20, 30, 40, 50 years with the virus. Um, I work under the supposition it's not good. It's not good for our bodies. So in those months, I recommitted myself towards that. Um, I also look at the larger world, and now it's um, as others who are HIV negative, um, HIV positive as I am now, I encourage you to even take better care of yourself, physically, emotionally, spiritually, any directions and all of those. Um, one last direction, I feel, is for those who are HIV negative, they have no experiential, personal understanding of what it's like. You know, and for many in the world today, oh, I can take a medication, it'll take care of it. Oh my gosh, that is, you know, why would you, what, you might as well take a gun and put it to your head, and I so don't like that construct. But why? Um, so. Um, so, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, um, probably the researcher, what, you said earlier that he probably bought some time, and I'm curious what you meant by that particularly since he was able to go back on the meds once the virus reestablished itself, and he was, he, obviously you're not resistant to those meds, which gives me a lot of hope that somebody can go back on meds. But you said he probably bought some time. Um, bought you some time, but that was it, is what you said. And so um, I'm really curious about what that means. Yeah, before Tim answers it, I'd like okay. to respond to uh, what you posited. We know now in hindsight that I was able to go back on meds and the meds were effective and there don't seem to be any outward or inward manifestations. There are some, um, but they're transplant related. Um, GVHD, graft versus host disease, I have a little discoloration here. There were a couple of months I lived with hyena skin. That's not an uncommon reaction to transplants. But in hindsight, it all has worked out. Mm -hmm. um, going into the study, and these were discussions we had, I absolutely was aware that coming off meds could shorten my life or bring on complications that staying on meds would likely not bring on. And that to me is the key, con the key element. Yeah. So what's some time? Yeah, I think uh, referring to, when, when, when we think about HIV cure, there's different levels, there's different ways of what cure means. 
I think there's an analogy now with oncology, actually, that, that researchers are using that almost is in terms of remission. So when we look at cancer treatments, we're saying, what is the survival at five years, for example? So we could use that analogy for HIV and say, can we have five years off ART before virus rebounds? And is that a goal that we should go for? And would it be helpful and or would it be beneficial to the to the person who's undergoing that interruption to be. So I think that's probably where I was <laughs> trying to go, so I apologize about confusion. Um, but having time off of enterotraw therapy without virus replicating and infecting new cells or being detected um, is potentially a big step. Okay. And, and I'm curious, the only one more thing, um, I'm curious about what happened with patient A, was he able to, also able to go successfully back to his enteroviruses, and how is that person doing? He, he was, was. yeah, no, he's doing fine. I can't give you more information, but... Um, no, I'm no. Sure. I mean, never mind. No. Okay, back to me. Hi, um, hi everyone, and um, um, these meetings here, I'm, I'm over here. Um, I usually sort of the best part of, um, of, you know, I've been to this conference a few times and um, just, you know, having, um, you know, uh, participants and researchers speak is so humanizing. And I think it's going to be really critical um, as we start to spread the word about cure to just hear, um, you know, people like Gary speak and also humanize researchers. Um, I had wanted to follow up with something Wahida said because I've been coming here enough to learn a little bit um, about cure. And one of the things that I have learned is that when the cure does come, it's not going to be a one size fits all. And part of that was, I think, established last year with um, Dr. Khan's research with regards women, where I think there was some belief that um, estrogen or something had something to do with it. And I've asked this question every year. I've never gotten a satisfactory answer about um, what is it um, about women that maybe discourages researchers to actively seek them out. Like Do Dr. Timothy, have you, um, you know, like, I know this is a very, very slim category, but I know you work for a women's hospital. I mean, isn't there a woman that has, you know, <laughs> cancer that, did you actively look for someone like that? I mean, where are Absolutely. Here? Yeah, no. So, uh, and, and you bring up a problem not just with HIV research, but in medical research since essentially its inception, that women have traditionally been left out of essentially all medical research. Cardiology, huge example. Um, oncology as well. And the reasons are, are varied, and I, I'm not an expert on this and, and, and whatnot, but it's, it's, it's very true, it is pervasive, and it also is true for HIV research. And I think that we are all trying to change that. Because as, as you're mentioning, uh, John Karn uh, from Cleveland has found that there are differences in how HIV is able to infect new cells and how it's able to persist, simply based on hormone levels and, and different levels of estrogen in the body. And, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, you know, how, how much more is there? A lot, you know? So uh, we are all actively trying to find more women uh, to be in, in studies. Uh, I know the Foundation for AIDS Research as well is really trying to push this too to kind of try to really make this a priority to say, look, we need to find, you know, the diversity of participants because that gives us a better answer. People are different. And we need to know how these cures are going to be on the whole gamut of everybody. And that's something that's difficult. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, historical reasons why women have been left out of research, everything from potential reproductive risk to, you know, I mean, there's, there's a huge, uh, huge, you know, kind of push to kind of rectify this, I think, as we go forward. And I, and I would strongly agree with that. Yeah. Can I, can I just add to that point? Um, how are you doing? Good to see you again. Um, that researchers and institutions that are doing research have to make it happen, however it needs to happen to get more women into trials. We've been talking about this for years, and it always comes back to the same thing. Well, it, it, it's it's just that's the way it is, or you know, there's some 
variable or excuse, but I think the fact of the matter is we have to, have to figure out and work with community to ensure that there's you know equitable diversity in these trials, no matter what it takes, because it just can't stay the way it's been for all these years. That's, that's a personal feeling I have about it. Um, first, Gary, I just want to thank you for talking about um, kind of the seriousness that it still is being HIV positive with and being undetectable, because that's I'm undetectable, and that's my biggest fear is the long-term effects of the drugs. But then also, it goes straight to a survivor's guilt of the medications that I've been on are much less toxic than the individuals at Bailey Boucher um, that have to go to dialysis multiple times a week. And so I guess when you were talking about waking up and not having to take the meds, and kind of that excitement, did you also develop a sense of survivor's guilt at all during that period? Um, no, no, I, I look to the future. Um, I inherited in, you know, incalculable hopefulness from my father. Um, I'm doing the best. Have I had ramifications and complications? from this, from the transplant, I mean, you know, even, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, but I'm always looking to what's going to be next um, and building towards that. So survivor's guilt is not something I, I, I have and I'm, I don't want to take it on. Um, I encourage you not to. It's like you're doing the best you can and that your body is different than her body or his body or his body or her body, that's, you know, that's the great unknowns of science. Um, so don't let it bring you down. I don't let it bring me down. It empowers me to just that, do, okay. to do what I can you. for the cause. Yeah. yeah, I had a question for Tim in regards to uh, the planning of this clinical trial. Uh, when you used uh, the word cure for this clinical trial, tell me about some of the ethical loopholes that you had to jump through and maybe some of the biggest issues, um, especially as we're moving forward in these you know, newer cure trials. Um, could you inform us of that? Yeah, we actually never used the word cure. Um, I, don't, did, I don't think we did. No, I don't, we tried not to. Um, we, 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 were, we were quite careful about this when we put this together. Um, you know, it's interesting, when you look about some of the media coverage that came out, it was like, you know, researchers claim cure. Uh, you know, clearly we never actually said that. Uh, this was not language that we had chosen to use. It is language that we had chosen not to use. Um, but media being the media, you know, it, it took on a life of its own. And it, we tried to control it as much as we could. Um, we were very careful when we put this together. We didn't know what was going to happen. And that's what we wanted the participants to know. We didn't want to provide false hope. We wanted to provide information for them to make a decision that this was going to be something that's useful for the field, that will benefit the field, but may not directly benefit the participant themselves. And I think that's uh, maybe maybe in 32 pages was too long. Well, uh, <laughs> but you know, but that's that's what we tried to do when we do this. I think over time the word cure has become a catch-all. Um, and it's a simplistic summary because I can, as you ask the question, I can hear Tim hypothetically saying to me, this is what we're looking to find out, you know, 32 pages later, I'm like, oh, you're talking cure. And it isn't cure. And he would be like, well, yeah, okay, sure. You know, you can call it that, but it's not that. Um, it's looking to advance and, you know, has, you know, has the virus been eradicated from your body, Gary? Cure. But it's, you know, it, it's a catch-all word. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi there. Um, thank you all for spending your evening with us. Um, I just had a question for Timothy about some of your ongoing and current research. So since Gary and patient A have been enrolled in your study, um, to talk a little bit about the heterogeneity of your patient populations and maybe ages, or if you're able to, um, just a little bit more about what you're currently doing. Yeah, I, I can't provide any specifics just yet because a lot of the studies that we're doing are not closed or haven't, haven't, we haven't reported those initial findings. Um, we obviously are still enrolling stem cell transplant patients. 
Um, so we, we're, we have more letters, <laughs> more participant letters. They don't get to choose, though. They get assigned. Um, we also have a few other studies that I'm involved with uh, that have actually come out of information that we learned from Gary and from the other participants in the trial. Uh, we have a trial that I'm running through the AIDS Clinical Trials Group looking at serolimus or rapamycin, which is actually a drug used for graft versus host disease prophylaxis after stem cell transplant, which you were on, and actually led to us to become very interested in this medication as a potential adjuvant uh, for enterotrophic therapy to reduce the size of the HIV reservoir. Uh, that trial is currently enrolling, um, so I can't give specifics, but I can say that we have tried extremely hard uh, over 15 participating sites to include a diverse patient population. And I want to say that we are succeeding, but I can't give you details outside of that. We, we have made that a priority. Um, uh, we have another trial we're about to start at UCSF locally, looking at another immunotherapy, immunodulator therapy, and that's exactly the same uh, as well. Um, and we're also doing another trial uh, that is almost personalized medicine where, uh, you know, the genetic background or makeup of the patient actually kind of dictates how they're going to be treated. So kind of the new wave of, of these tailored personal therapies. And that's, that's about to start as well. But again, I, 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 sorry I can't give you any more details. just for confidentiality reasons. But we are trying our best, and I'm hoping that we're doing better uh, than the norm. Yeah, and for the Sarah Lamus study, don't we have one of those sites here? You do, and ah, and Dr. Collier's right here. Yes, and and uh, yes, I'm sorry. And and if anybody is interested, uh, absolutely, right here. The site PI is right here. And Washington, by the way, this has been one of our most active sites in terms of uh, communication and ideas and patients. So, um, absolutely. So, uh, anybody who's interested, we would absolutely love to to have you on board, so um, yeah. So yes, and there's other, there's other ones. Yes, please, please, yes, yes, we would love that. Hi, Gary. First of all, I want to commend you for being here and for your great attitude. Well, I have two questions. First of all, first question is, um, is it possible that you got reinfected? instead of being cured. Second, what was your CD4 count before and what was your CD count after the trial? Um, as to the first question, <coughs> Tim will answer it, but no, it's, it was, I was not reinfected. No chance, it was his virus, yeah. Um, and my CD4 count is pretty comparable now to what it was before, um, before coming off um, medications. Um, that was also an interesting anecdote related to the stem cell transplant because I understood it to be usually your CD4 tell, uh, cell will drop precipitously. Mine didn't, but that's just another one of those anomalies my body seems to be going through. Um, Dr. Heinrich, in your mind, did the fact that Gary had a more compatible HLA match uh, change the duration of his remission? We are still looking into that. That is a great question. Um, so, it is so what we're finding is that, uh, uh, Gary's mentioned this graft versus host disease a few times. What happens after a transplant is that you get this conditioning chemotherapy. They call it conditioning. It sounds like something you put in your hair to make it all like, ooh, you know, I'm conditioned. It's it actually, wasn't, it wasn't yeah, I'm going to say, no. I haven't gone through it, but I'm sure Gary will understand this is this nasty stuff. It's, it's cytotoxic. It reduces the levels of your own immune system drastically, uh, followed by infusion of the donor cells. And those donor cells actually, so, so one of the reasons that the cancer doesn't come back or the bone marrow is healthy is not necessarily from that, that high-dose chemotherapy, it may be a part of it, but it's the donor cells that come in are a little bit different than the body that they're put into, right? They may be from, they might be from a, a related donor, they might be from an unrelated donor, or maybe a stem, uh, you know, cord blood uh, transplant, but they're a little bit different. And a little bit of difference 
may be a very good thing because that little bit of difference may recognize any leftover tumor or any leftover cancer or potentially, which is our hypothesis that we're trying to prove, that there is residual, that it may actually target residually infected cells and be able to clear those out. And actually, we'll, we'll, I'll be talking tomorrow, we have a little bit of the data to suggest that probably is the case. If you have too much of that, which can go along with being mismatched, so the more mismatch you have, the more of this response you can potentially get. And I apologize all for all the, the transplant docs in the audience if I'm doing a good job with trying to make this actually sound reasonable. But uh, that can actually then start to attack the skin, for example, or the other organs, and can actually increase morbidity related to the stem cell transplant. So there seems to be a balance. And this is, I mean, this is, again, speculation. This is based on information that we've had so far that we're trying to pursue, that you need a little bit of that difference, but not too much. Uh, and it's possible that you got a little bit of the difference, yeah, but not too much. The, um, Rob Soifer, the oncologist transplant doc I'm under in Boston, has said all along, I've had a low-grade GVHD and in his perception and from the medical community, that is a better prognosis long-term than none or you know, high-grade. Absolutely, without hesitation. The question uh, was, would he do it again? I'm sorry? Would he do it Would again? Would I do it again? If he was yes. Um, um, no one's come to me. Um, <laughs> you know, then again, I have been through enough roller coasters that it's like, whoa, you don't fit the. It's like, have you done that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But would I do it again? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh, any other questions? I have one other question. Okay. I just wanted to ask um, Timothy, earlier on you talked about boosting the immune system before you start this process. What does that look like? So, so one of the thoughts in HIV eradication strategies is how can you get a better immune response to those residual cells that are still infected on antiretroviral therapy. And that's really hard to do. But I think we're learning how to do it better and better every day. Um, in the setting of stem cell transplant, the immune system actually changes after stem cell transplant. It's a little bit different. Uh, and what I think everybody wants to learn is those little differences that exist after stem cell transplant. How can you hijack those? How can you take those pieces that are different that may be helping keep that HIV reservoir really low, or the number of infected cells really low, and then adapt that as a therapy where you don't need a full transplantation. So can you, is there a particular cell type that's gonna be more active after transplantation that might be beneficial, for example? And then can you take those cells and then infuse them alone without having to do a full transplant? So these, these are the types, of, these are the types of, of thinking, I think, that goes on, that it's not just about the transplant, but it's also about how can we make this, if we learn from the transplant, what, what pieces of it can we take that may be less dangerous and more scalable to more people, and how can we do that? And I think, well, CAR T cell, yeah. So I mean, not directly with transplant, absolutely. So you can take a T cell, which is one of the main white blood cells in your body that can attack infected cells and infection. And if you can modify those to really recognize HIV infected cells, for example. And uh, University of Washington, the Fred Hutch here, I think, just got this amazing grant from the NIH to study these types of studies. So I'm sure there's gonna be, I can't see, I'm, I'm from San Francisco, but uh, we're all interested in these studies. And I think that we have been following very closely and are very excited about the studies that are ongoing here about that. But that, that would be an example, yeah. I just wanna put a little spin on my first question. Being the unique, one of a kind person in this whole world who has had it, lost it, and got it again, are there any insights, maybe even on a spiritual level, that you could offer or share about what it means to be a positive person? Mm. 
most likely best described in using the exact same word, being a positive person, but not in the context we talk about it in this room. About everything. You know, the, um, you know, um, when I, when my bone marrow started failing and the docs were saying, you're gonna need this transplant, but you don't need it now. It could go on for three months, it can go on for three years, it can go on for 10 years. I would just be, for me it was anemic. I was just really sluggish. And then I got accepted into a program where I'd become a docent at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Such an aspiration for me and it was like, let's go. We're doing the transplant now because this is my future. And it was timed to the day I was told I need 100 days to recover, and from the day of the transplant to the day the program started was 100 days, and I was like, let's go. It's like, I'm looking to where I want to go. Um, and for me, in a closing um, thought is one to the advocates and the activists, I absolutely adore you and thank you for all you're doing. But it's really, from my heart to the medical community, um, you don't get thanked enough for this long slog you've been going through that is not, it's just not getting there to all of our desires fast enough, but my appreciation is um, <laughs> deep. So I guess, are we at, at time or? Yeah. So can I, I wanted to say one thing about what Fred Hutch and De the Defeat HIV people are doing here in Seattle and that is what I've seen progress over the, the several years you guys have been operating and you had this amazing cab here, Community Advisory Board, that does uh, such a terrific job, not only with you know helping inform the uh, the researchers, which is a, a role of a community advisory boards, but also to inspire the community. And, and just the way, Michael, thank you so much for your leadership and, and the way this has all evolved. I've seen it over the past, what, six years now, five years? And um, no one does it better, and nobody does it better. Um, so, uh, thank you. This is kind of really cool. I see a model here for how we can get patients and communities to really work together the way they should and the way they should have been all the time. It's always been this kind of, you know, fight, not fight, but um, it, it's just a great, well, fight, yeah, f fight too, but this is working well, is what I want to say. So thank you. And, um, Speaking of Michael. Okay. Yeah, well, so we have a, oops. So we just wanted to thank Gary and Tim for giving their time to us. And so our cab put together some gift bags. And I'm still not confused. Which one is going to whom? <laughs> Here, why don't you take them? For I get the one with the red blood cells. Yes, and the other ones. <laughs> Uh, but really, so there's lots of goodies in there for you, and uh, some of them are homemade. Um, one of the things I wanted to make sure, um, one of our cab members makes notebooks, and so you each have a notebook that says nothing about us without us in there. That's a homespun thing, and I'll leave us with that. So I want to thank you all, audience. I hope you learned a lot and got a lot from it. If you want to get more, you can get more by signing up and giving us your emails so you can get the emails and find out other events and help us with future things that we want to do here in Seattle as well as out in the world beyond Seattle. Uh, so thank you very much and stick around a little bit, talk to each other, come up and talk to them. But thank you and have a good evening and safe drive home.